Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Warm greetings from New Zealand. My name is Mark Nichols, Executive Director of Learning Design and Development with the Open Polytechnic of New Zealand. I'm an ICDE Executive Committee member and your host for this Leadership Summit. In this opening presentation, I will provide some background to the conference theme and introduce the dimensions of flexibility we'll be exploring over the next two days. The overall summit theme is leadership for responsiveness, focusing on the key question, are we flexible enough? The event organizing committee in association with the ICDE selected this theme for four main reasons. Firstly, flexible is part of ICDE's identity in promoting open, flexible and distance learning, and it aligns perfectly with our commitment to improving access, equity, equality, inclusion, diversity and integrity for education. Second is the issue of resilience, which is surely an overarching theme for education in 2021. The experiences we have all had during the COVID pandemic have established the need for education systems to become more robust and resilient. Flexibility is an important element of that, in that there are dimensions of flexibility that make a response to lockdown conditions much easier. Third, flexibility emerged as a key outcome from last year's ICDE President's Forum. Despite the theme of flexibility stretching back for decades, it seems we still see it as a desirable and necessary point of focus. And finally, we adopted flexibility because it is remarkably open-ended. This can make talking about it difficult, as we'll see, but it also makes it a very universally relevant theme. We all have a helpful view as to what flexibility might be, and so we all have to gain from the conversation. My presentation is in three parts. To begin with, I'll try to provide a framework for us to consider what flexibility is. At the very least, we need to have a similar understanding of what we're talking about during this summit. Second, I'll explore the three dimensions of flexibility that serve as the focal points for this event. I'll close with some self-assessment tools and reflections related to improving flexibility in education. So how should we think about flexibility? Now, I completed my undergraduate degree half my lifetime ago. The internet was in its early days, and the expectation was that if you wanted to gain a degree, you had to attend campus full-time. Part-time options were only available to those who lived locally. Correspondence options were print and block course based, and usually best for postgraduate students. I remember in my last year of study, married and with a young son, struggling to make ends meet. It was difficult to study full-time and hold down part-time work that would help pay the bills. If you missed a lecture, you'd have to find notes from a friend. Once the academic year ended, you'd have to find full-time work over the summer break because study times were limited to two semesters. To take notes from a journal article, you'd need to go to the library, and after finding it, you'd either have to read what you wanted there or else photocopy it and take it away. Looking back, there's not much in that picture that's flexible. Some 25 years on, much of what I mentioned is still in place, despite almost everything else being very different. 25 years ago, any bank transactions had to be done by a teller, though you could withdraw cash from a money machine. I can't remember when I last visited a bank. For our most recent mortgage, the broker visited us, and all of our banking is now done online. 25 years ago, if I wanted a specific technical book, I might have to order it from overseas. Now I can purchase and download almost any title instantly. I have immediate access to more books than any local bookstore could ever hope to stock. Those of you over 35, you'll have your own examples of how things have rapidly become more flexible, accessible, immediate, with better options, and often cheaper and easier to use than what you can remember from earlier years. Life is more flexible. Flexibility is all around us. But how about in education? Have we kept up with what's possible from a flexible perspective? Are we flexible enough? My youngest son is now at university, and he still needs to navigate semesters, timetables, and lecture attendance. Much of what I experienced is still very familiar to him. Are we flexible enough? I invite you now to think about the terms you associate with the word flexibility as it applies to education, and if you want to, add them to the chat. When you think about flexibility in education, what sort of terms come to mind? For this event, we've defined flexibility in education as a set of educational philosophies and systems concerned with providing learners with increased choice, convenience and personalization to suit the learner, 
particularly as to where, how and when study takes place. Straight away we run into a major difficulty. Firstly, there is the issue of subjectivity. The word increased implies that flexibility is not an either-or. Instead, it's a spectrum from less to more flexible. The immediate risk here is that what's flexible from my perspective may not be flexible from your perspective. What's desirable from a flexible perspective for me may not be the same as for you. In fact, we may disagree with one another entirely, even though we have the same overall objective. In the 2011 book Flexible Pedagogy, Flexible Practice, which is an important one in this presentation, Colin Latcham and Insung Jung draw attention to the Indian legend of the six blind men and the elephant, which I think nicely summarises the term flexible as it relates to education. The legend is written as a poem by John Godfrey Saxe. You can find the poem online. Here, just let me read part of it. It was six men of understand, to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each, by observation, might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant, and, happening to fall against his broad and sturdy side, at once began to bawl, God bless me, but the elephant is nothing but a wall. The second feeling of the tusk cried, Ho, oh, what have we here, so very round and smooth and sharp? To me, it is mighty clear. This wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. Others conclude that the elephant is like a snake, fan, tree, and rope. The poem concludes, And so these men of understand disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right, and all were in the wrong. And so we tend to use terms like flexibility very casually, usually from our own immediate view of the world. If we're going to be really able to learn from one another and make progress toward flexibility in our practice, it's important that we try to see the whole elephant, or at least be very clear about which part we're considering as we talk about it. So our first difficulty in discussing flexibility is the subjectivity we each bring to the term. Second, there's the issue of compliance. There may be some funding rules or educational requirements that force us into particular ways of operating. These requirements are usually in place for good reason, but they can limit our options. For example, in New Zealand, a full-time student is assumed to study 120 credits in a single year, which reflects the full-time schedule of a two-semester university. There can be funding limitations for institutions seeking to provide their students with more study options within the same year that might take them over 120 credits. So our flexible options are shaped by the way things work, things that might be outside of our immediate control. Third is the issue of balance. I need to spend a bit of time here because this is a critical point related to why we find it so difficult to agree on the right level of flexibility in education. This slide aims to demonstrate the spectrum of flexibility, from completely fixed, where the student might have no choice about what they study, the order in which they study it, when they start, or when they learn, right through to completely open, where the student might be able to enrol at any time in anything, and hand in whatever they want, whenever they want, by way of assessment. Our concern is whether the level of flexibility on offer improves educational effectiveness, because ultimately we want our learners to be successful. You can see in the middle of this diagram some of the questions that might determine the optimal level of flexibility. To what extent is providing more access educationally effective? Do we need to insist on certain entry criteria to improve educational effectiveness? Is the level of study relevant and that should we have different types of flexibility for sub-degree and postgraduate students? For example, does the spectrum look like this for postgraduate study, where learners are confident, self-motivated students and might be held back by rigid schedules? And does it look more like this for those students who are new to higher education, where too much flexibility might just be confusing and full structure helps to provide focus? Does higher education need a series of flexible approaches, depending on the learner's general characteristics? Or should more flexible options be made available alongside a more structured approach? Or is it possible to provide different forms of support for learners to help them in their flexible study? 
If that's the case, who chooses whether a learner might suit a more flexible approach? Coming back to our more generic diagram, you can see some additional questions, and there are others besides. Even the premise of the diagram itself can be called into question. Is educational effectiveness more important than giving everyone an opportunity to study? So we see that flexibility is actually rather complex, but we're not quite finished yet. The fourth issue is one of change. Any changes to the level of flexibility a higher education institution seeks to implement will likely require a major change program. As an example, making it possible for students to enrol at any time will require changes to recruitment and results processes, teaching roles, student communications, virtual learning environments, course tutoring, tutorial structures, and likely assessment and curriculum changes. This sort of institutional adjustment can be incredibly disruptive and time consuming. Deciding to become more flexible usually results in more work, at least until the processes and systems surrounding the new ways of doing things are finalised and streamlined, and until policies are agreed and implemented. So no wonder David Harris, cited in Burge, Gibson and Gibson, notes that flexible learning encompasses as many paradoxes and contradictions as conventional learning. It is important to avoid seeing flexible learning as some panacea and to view it instead as an ambiguous development, one that requires intervention to develop the good sides and avoid the bad. So given all of this, what do we do? How do we determine what is good and avoid what is bad? Becoming more flexible is difficult, so is it even worth the effort? How will we know whether our assumptions and plans for more flexibility are the right ones? Here we are caught up in a theme that sits around these questions like a dark cloud. Flexibility is a power game. Who does more flexibility empower and who does it disempower? There are real tensions here in that increasing flexibility can have major implications for teaching practices and choice. These issues get to the very heart of the identity of those teaching in higher education. So we must face the question. Are our inherited and traditional ways of teaching so effective and sacred that we dismiss making it possible for more students to achieve an education in ways more suitable to their choices and preferences? I think if we're to best understand flexibility and what it might achieve, we're best to begin with learners themselves. Rather than starting from the supply side by asking what we can do, we're best to start from the learner's perspective of what they want. Some of these wants may need to be reshaped, renegotiated, or even set aside, but there will be many that will challenge us to change and improve how we do things. In this Leadership Summit, we've asked five learners to provide their perspectives as to what flexibility might mean for them, and I admit that I'm looking forward to what they have to say. So let's take a look at the framework adopted by this event, describing different forms of flexibility to help us to challenge our practice and make education more resilient. I've already mentioned how flexibility is a difficult concept to discuss. So how do we best structure a conversation around it? There are various models and perspectives we might draw on. For this Leadership Summit, though, we've selected three dimensions of flexibility to help broaden our conversation and focus it beyond what we do ourselves. Before deciding what we might change to make more flexible, it's worthwhile to explore learner expectations, our organisational contexts, and examples of teaching and learning practice. So our three dimensions of flexibility for the summit are as follows. Firstly, scope. By this, we mean determining what we consider to be important as far as flexibility is concerned. To address this, the Leadership Summit considers the question, how are learners' expectations changing? This is an important question because it starts with a student rather than a supply side point of view. In other words, it's not so much what we might value as educators that's important. The student view is at the forefront here. Second, approach. Our key sub-theme question here is, what limitations do our organisational structures place on flexibility? Answering this question will give us insight as to the nature of organisational change that may be needed to improve flexibility. 
In this theme, we'll be hearing from presenters who have a vision for enhancing flexibility and who have either led or designed their organisations into more flexible practice. Third, we dedicate a sub-theme to practice. In this theme, we address the question, how flexible are our teaching and learning approaches? Our presenters here provide insight into how teaching and learning might be extended in support of more flexible education. I want to provide some introductory thoughts here from my own perspective, beginning with scope and the question of how are learner expectations changing. I mentioned in the opening part of this presentation how flexibility is now all around us. Higher education remains a notable exception to how technology and customer-centric service is bringing us more options and choice in our day-to-day -day lives. Yet as a whole, higher education seems to be becoming more expensive, less imaginative in its practice, and stuck in a rut as far as online methodologies are concerned. I see no reason why, technologically, pedagogically, and operationally, higher education can't be offered to anyone, anywhere, at any time. If I want to study business, nursing, engineering, or hairdressing toward a recognized qualification, I ought to be able to start right now from my own home. There are many creative and effective pedagogical techniques that might support me through the theory, thinking, and practice I need to master in order to qualify. Some of it might require work experience, block courses, or practicums, but these might come later as necessary. I'm also an adult learner, so real life happens all around me, and at best I can only commit myself to part-time study. Some real life circumstances might take a few weeks to clear, so why can't I simply pause my study during that time frame and pick up where I left off, without penalty or having to wait for another course offering to come around? Or if I'm learning about horticulture, could I not study courses and do assessment as the seasons progress? Could I not do it on the job or as a volunteer and provide examples of my practice via video as opportunity arises rather than to a set due date? These are some of the things that occur to me from a scope perspective. It's more than just being able to watch recordings of lectures or choose my own assessment topic. The sort of flexibility I'm talking about here cuts to the very heart of timetabling, semesterization, subject choice and availability, and dealing with the unexpected consequences of modern life. How ambitious is our desire for flexibility? How flexible are we? Moving on to approach, where our key sub-theme question is, what limitations do our organisational structures place on flexibility? This is a very big question, and I'm certain the answers will differ for everyone watching this presentation. Let me offer a few observations here. To begin with, organisational structures are as they are, based on the overall requirements of compliance. Requirements for accreditation, conditions set for public funding, the need for ongoing financial viability, and the expectations of multiple stakeholders all shape the way in which higher ed education institutions are put together. Your own institution operates the way it does for good reason, or at least it was at one stage. You see, institutional shapes tend to become rigid over time. The way things are done can actively work against or limit the level of flexibility that would otherwise be easily possible. If your institution offers courses on a semesterized basis, moving to an anytime enrollment situation will be extremely difficult. In fact, most of what I mentioned earlier in my scope piece relies on organizational change. It takes a tremendous amount of vision and leadership to change organizational structures and ways of operating to make more flexibility possible. Enduring and significant flexibility can only be sustained by an organization willing to adapt to make it possible. So how flexible are we? Finally, into the realm of practice. Our sub-theme question here is, how flexible are our teaching and learning approaches? My first encounter with flexible learning was in the late 1990s. I'd just been appointed as lecturer at a regional polytechnic in New Zealand, in an organisation that had decided to pursue flexible learning as a strategy. My first project involved developing asynchronous learning resources that I provided to my students in addition to and in replacement of lectures in the early days of the web and HTML. I'm still fairly proud of what I achieved back then, and I was later recognised as a flexible learning leader in New Zealand. But there is now so much more available to us to help promote learner success flexibly. Learning analytics, online learning approaches, 
peer mentoring practices, online collaboration and video conferencing tools, device capability and resource access have improved tremendously since my premillennium lecturing practice. What was once considered flexible might no longer be. We can also be misled into overestimating the flexible potential of educational technology. I remember, for example, the days when providing lectures and tutorials in Second Life was considered one way of becoming more flexible. For the record, I never really saw the sense of that. So the possibilities of flexible teaching and learning approaches will change over time as we learn more about what's technologically possible and what works in other situations. There will also be clever practice from around the world that we can draw inspiration and insight from. My last section in this presentation aims to get you thinking about your own practice and perspectives as they relate to our Leadership Summit theme. You're at this event because you're a leader in higher education, and so an important part of this event is learning from you and having you learn from one another over the next two days. What I want to do in this final section is to get you thinking about the level of flexibility you consider optimal in your educational practice. To do this, I want to point you to a 2018 ICDE report and a chapter published a decade ago in a free online book called Flexible Pedagogy, Flexible Practice. Both are freely available online. Let's begin with the excellent global analysis performed by Dominic Orr, Martin Weller and Rob Farrow. The UFAT model, standing for Online, Open, Flexible and Technology Enhanced, is a result of an international investigation into practice. The report highlights how three core processes of higher education, content, delivery and recognition, are expressed in terms of organisational flexibility and procedural openness. The report also demonstrates six typologies based on a series of case studies from institutions worldwide and identifies five business strategies of how UFAT is implemented. The report helpfully provides an UFAT template that can be used as the basis for mapping out your own institution's scores across various criteria, scoring each element on a scale from one to five. It's worthwhile considering your own institution and where you think it might or ought to be as an opportunity to reflect on your own understanding and preferences for flexible practice. The entire report is a rewarding read, and you can use the same template to outline your own preferences in terms of where you think flexibility should lie. I also want to draw your attention to chapter 16, pages 211 to 226 in the Gibson and Gibson book, where they highlight the various factors driving and restraining flexibility, including socio-cultural and economic forces, institutional forces and individual forces. Here are some of the forces they highlight, which I won't go into any detail for now. I'm certain most will be familiar to you. Under socio-cultural and economic forces, you'll see many elements not directly under the control of higher education institutions. This context changes from time to time, usually improving the possibilities for flexibility. You'll see here mention of such things as employment levels, digital infrastructure and employer demands. We could also add a more technologically rich and literate society, though I acknowledge that this is not yet universal. Still, the overall trajectory is certain. The institutional forces you see here are probably more familiar to you. At the time of this event, the New Zealand vocational education sector is being reconsidered, and many of these factors resonate with me very clearly. As with the socio-cultural and economic factors, the tensions across these forces change over time. Elements such as vision, anticipated commercial benefit, and scalability in student demands are included in this list. Finally, the individual forces are suggested. These apply to teachers and learners as individuals, even though the learner perspective might go well beyond time expectations and a preference for face-to-face -face instruction. You'll see teaching and learning beliefs and responses to change all mentioned here. At the close of their chapter, the authors propose 10 questions you might apply to your own institution to assess its flexibility from page 224. Have the mandates imposed by legislative and accrediting bodies been reviewed? The requirements for these mandates may have changed, perhaps enabling more flexibility. Does the institution use a collaborative planning process that involves students, faculty, staff, administration and funding agencies? 
are all stakeholders a part of the planning. Some of them might have some very good ideas. Has a written institutional situation analysis of socio-cultural, economic, institutional and individual forces been prepared? Again, these may have changed, enabling more flexibility. Does the institution have an operational or situational definition of flexibility? Or are they unclear as to which part of the elephant they're looking at? How does the mission statement address flexibility? I invite you to consider the others at your leisure. Each of these questions are as pertinent today as they were 10 years ago, and they were also relevant 25 years ago when I began my own explorations in flexible education. It's timely for us to revisit them in this event. Flexibility is an enduring theme, and its importance to us today is reinforced by the COVID pandemic. Flexibility is an essential element of resilience, and so it's likely that flexibility will become a still more important part of how we operate in higher education as the years go on. So as we discuss flexibility over the next two days, your perspective very much matters. So, are we flexible enough? This is an enduring question, and our focus over the next two days, though the size of this question and all of those around it surely requires much more time. I trust we're all challenged and changed through the presentations, conversations and plenaries we're about to enjoy. So welcome again to the 2021 ICDE Leadership Summit. I'm looking forward to further exploring these event themes with you. Next in our summit, we will learn from our learners. And so our challenges begin.